The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Atticus was almost home when the state trooper pulled him over. He'd left Jacksonville two days before in a second-hand 48 Cadillac coupe that he'd bought with the last of his army pay. The first day he drove 450 miles, eating and drinking from a basket he'd packed in advance, stopping the car only to get gas. At one of the gas stops, the colored restroom was out of order, and when the attendant refused him the key to the white's room, Atticus was forced to urinate in the bushes behind the station. So begins Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everybody, welcome to the second episode. This is Michael T. Bradley. This is Skixmatics. Today we're going to talk about Lovecraft Country mm-hmm. by Matt Ruff. Not McGruff the Crime <laughs> Dog, as I earlier thought, <laughs> but Matt Ruff. Please send any feedback, comments, thoughts, etc. to Dread dot dialectic at gmail.com and we would also love to see your horror novels or novellas i don't think we're interested in short story collections uh, mostly just because they're kind of more difficult to talk about but you know pitch it we'll see yeah what the hell you know if you feel really strongly about it and you think it would fit then uh, then definitely send it along the one thing that i will warn is that I personally won't be able to read something in a PDF format. Uh, It's just uh, I have a thing with my eyes, and I can do Kindle and uh, EPUB, probably even like a shared Google Docs uh, I could probably get away with, but PDF, uh, my eyes are not fond of reading, which is a real bitch when it comes to dealing with a lot of things. But anyway, let's go ahead and talk about our entry today, Lovecraft Country. This was my recommendation. We are uh, going to be dealing a lot with uh, racist themes in a lot, a lot of different ways. I mean, it's just kind of, it's, it's almost impossible for it not to come up. Because of that, you know, there, there's this kind of uh, understanding, right, that certain words you don't say unless there's, like, a reason to be saying them. Like, the, for instance, those words are used in this novel because it's time-appropriate and situational-appropriate. And I really thought about with this episode, like, oh, does that make the review appropriate to say those words? And I I really don't think it does, because I think it would easily come across as a couple of white guys just kind of like being really empowered uh, to say those words. And so I thought if we ever have an N-word, we'll replace it with Strom Thurmond. (laughs) Skix, if you would like to set us up with a plot synopsis, go for it. I can do that. I first heard about the book some blog I follow or other was doing uh, recommendations of books with people of color as protagonists. Uh, And this one sounded interesting. It was, it was pitched to me. The elevator pitch was Lovecraft without the racism, which is entirely misleading, but it's enough to draw draw me in. The racism uh, in this case is the antagonist's racism, not the author's racism. Yeah. It's about a family that publishes a book called The Safe Negro Travel Guide, which is a, a guide for uh, black people to travel around the United States, uh, particularly the Jim Crow South, uh, safely, because there are a lot of places that are not safe. For example, there were towns called sundown towns where black people were not allowed to be within the town limits after sundown, or they would be killed. No no arresting, no running out of town, just killed. And to uh, create this book, various family members and friends of the family uh, travel around the country to see if, like, is this town okay or not? Uh, And they find Lovecraftian sorts of adventures whenever they go into the New England area, which is known as Lovecraft Country. And it's uh, it's self-aware about that. The uh, characters have read the books of Lovecraft. They are genre savvy, shall we say. At least one of them is. Right, yes, at least one of them is. Uh, And the adventures they have are very diverse, and it's put together like uh, a series of short stories, but it is all one overarching tale. After after that uh, plot synopsis, we're going to go into 
you know, and I'll, I'll keep kind of reiterating this until everybody just gets it. Uh, we're going to go into three sections, or until we change the format, I guess. Uh, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good and the bad are things we liked and disliked about it, and, and we're going to keep those uh, generally as spoiler-free as possible. And then the ugly, uh, we're going to deal with, you know, the kind of the monster behind the door at the end, the mystery the monster, the and, and, and we'll go into all uh, spoilers uh, at that point. So All spoilers all the time! <laughs> so you're safe listening to this until the ugly, and, you know, for all I know, we might, I, I mean, we might not end up spoiling everything at, at that point. But in any case, uh, so let's talk about the good. Uh, let's talk about things that we uh, particularly enjoyed in this book. I just want to say I absolutely love, love, love the character Letitia. Yes. Letitia in this is just, she is just constantly a pleasure to read. And it really kind of frustrated me because she plays a pretty big part in the first story, which is, I would say, the by far the longest story, right? Yeah. And then the second story focuses around her. And I took this quote from the second story where... She, through various machinations, inherits, or not inherits, but is able to afford this house, this very large house. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's so cheap is because it's haunted, and she's having to deal with this ghost. And I, I just thought it was so funny, such a, a unique way to deal with this ghost, because the ghost tries to throw her over an elevator shaft that, the, where the elevator isn't there, and she grabs onto a pole... What you going to do? She cried. You break my neck, and then what? You think I won't come back and haunt you? Go ahead. Make me a ghost. See what that gets you. <laughs> and I just thought, that's such a great argument. Just like, you know, fuck you. I'll haunt you next. Go ahead, kill me, Harry. And especially great as we, we find out a bit later that she was set up. She was uh, put in that house by someone who knew it was haunted and knew she'd find a way to deal with it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And she did, but not the way anyone expected. I think my favorite thing about this book is by far Letitia. When she was first on the scene, it looked like she was going to be, I don't know how the relative ages are, but like the bratty younger sister. She's just like, going to get underfoot and all that. But no, no, she's, she holds her own. She takes charge. She's, uh, she may have snuck out in the, in the trunk of the car, but she yeah. was necessary. <laughs> Yeah, she really forces herself to be in the first story, even though it felt like it was supposed to be a father-son sort of story. Or, so, wait, is it uncle-son? I'm trying to remember who the uh, other... Un uh, uncle-son, but they're they're looking for his father. That's right, that's right. Uh, you know, it really felt like it was meant to be this kind of, like, son becoming a man or whatever, and Letitia just forces herself into that story and is like, nope, you guys need watching over, and she's totally right. So, I don't know, I just, I absolutely loved... Letitia, uh, Atticus is our, uh, he's the star of the first story, the longest story, and he's kind of, I mean, he's kind of the linchpin around which the yeah. entire... Yeah, he's, he's the ordinary hero, and, and all the other characters are more or less defined by their relationship to him, even though he kind of steps out of the story for a while. When you said that people are self-aware, Atticus is our very self-aware character, he's a Lovecraft fan, he enjoys Lovecraft, uh, and I don't know, I, I found that an odd choice. I almost kind of thought that the story maybe would have worked better without them being that self-aware, but there's the one scene that really kind of makes it necessary. Like, it's talking about how Montrose, Atticus's father, uh, kind of has to ruin everything that he enjoys. Like, that's, like, that, that seems to be he understands his role as a father is like, I must ruin everything. Any joy that my son might eke out of the world, I have to stamp on that. Finding that his son likes Lovecraft is basically like, hmm, Lovecraft's white. How can I show that this guy's horrible? And so he brings him a copy of uh, Lovecraft's poem on the creation of Strom Thurmond's. And, yes. And that scene is the scene where I was like, okay, this is why it was important for them to be self-aware about Lovecraft. You know, I mean, they use it as a, a throwaway joke early on where, where they misunderstand the name of a town. Arkham, and it's actually Arkham. Ar Artem. Uh, but coincidentally, Artem is also where there's a big old cult that mm -hmm. wants them for their bloodline and stuff. My other quote that I pulled is another example of them being self-aware of kind of, not just Lovecraft, but the tropes that they're being thrown into. And that is, you require me, Atticus said, to be your magic Strom Thurmond? And, <laughs> and so, I that made me laugh, because I was like, oh, they're just, 
I, like, I don't think that was a term that would have been used. <laughs> the two words can sit next to each other, but I'm not sure if it was a... a well, I, I don't know if they did trope names yet, either. I, who knows? I don't know. Right, right. I mean, that baseball movie hadn't come out yet, so I don't I don't think it was a thing. But yeah, it's... it's uh, uh, they're, they're, This is not a family that is constantly wallowing in problems of race or things like that the, there's just that awareness at the edges not always at the edges but what i like what i what i thought was very uh, well well put together is as you say they're not wallowing in racism that's not their day-to-day -day conversation it is however part of their environment mm -hmm. and just sort of you know walking up the street they've got to be aware of who's watching them or what street they're on it doesn't define the moment but it's still part of the water they swim in uh, and and i think that was well well done although obviously not being a black person from the 1940s so south part of america I, I i can't say that it's accurate but it feels accurate and i also am not a person of color from the south from 60 years ago but i saw that episode of quantum leap so i feel like <laughs> i'm qualified to say that this does a really good job of capturing that uh for sure <laughs> I know you're doing that as a joke, but I, I, I'll bet you someone said that before. Uh, the stories are all interesting. Uh, they stand alone, but they tie together. They sort of escalate the way you hope a story does. So even though it's a collection of shorts, it, it has its climax and resolution. So, I mean, if you're someone who doesn't like reading short stories, don't don't worry about it. These are just like very distinct chapters. They're, they're titled like short stories. Yeah, I think that's it for good. Uh, so now let's go on to the bad. Uh, things that we did not like about the book. I felt like the short stories were... They, they, they did all tie together, and it did all feel part of a, a homogenous mix and everything, but Atticus and Letitia were the two characters, uh, oh, and Caleb, were the characters I was most interested in, and once it stopped focusing on them... I mean, Caleb's always kind of like the end of every chapter. He's kind of a Voldemort. Like, he always kind of comes out of the shadows and it's like, oh, ha, ha, I did this, you know? But um, once uh, Atticus and Letitia disappear, I found basically everybody else very uninteresting. I, uh, I, I did not feel sucked into the stories after those first two. I, uh, I read most of them, but there were a couple that I actually just skipped because I was just so not interested. Uh, like, for instance, the Devil Doll one. Uh, I just... Completely, I was like, I don't care about yeah, that, Horace. And... That was a section of Creep Show, that one. <laughs> it was exactly the story you would expect. It does go in interesting directions, but it's mostly just a Creep Show story or a, a Twilight Zone story. The other thing that I felt is I, I really, like, with the setup and everything, I really thought we would have more Lovecraftian horror in this. And it's true that a lot of the things that Lovecraft dealt with are dealt with here in different ways but they're dealt with in such different ways that I never felt that kind of Lovecraftian, like, creeping terror or what, you know what I mean? Like, I, I it just, it, it, it didn't try to do this, so I'm not saying it failed necessarily, but I, I felt very frustrated by the fact that there wasn't more Lovecraftian horror. I think there's room for sequels to develop that further. There you go, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you, though. Uh, um... There were moments, uh, I mean, I felt there were moments of Lovecraftian horror, and there were moments that were clearly riffing on some of the things Lovecraft has done, but they, they also took influence from, well, if not Creepshow, I, I can't remember where the first Devil Doll story happened, but it's been around a while. Mm. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have seen it Lovecraftier, especially since they gave it the title. Well, and like, for instance, you know, uh, body swapping is a... Is a... I mean, that's, I, I swear that's been done in Lovecraft, uh, for sure, and, and there's a story, uh, uh, Ruby is the main character, where she body swaps and, uh, and, and wakes up white, and it, it's kind of, where things go with that, but I, but I just... more, more Jekyll and Hyde than body swap, I, I would have thought. Uh, sure, and, and so I get that it wasn't meant to be, like, it wasn't meant to have a Lovecraftian feel, it was more meant to be, like, you know, it was... <laughs> It was like a more serious version of that Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live skit, White Like Me. But still, I just wasn't necessarily interested by the story. I guess it felt like the story was like, things are easier if you're white. And I was like, yep, you know, I mean, 
<laughs> like I, I, I felt the same. However, that mechanic of, of, of Ruby swapping with, I can't remember what her white persona was. Hillary. Hillary is used further down and becomes more interesting. In that particular story, it's mm-hmm. like, eh, I don't know if this is okay, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's either saying nothing new or it's, I, I don't know what. But uh, but she uses that further down, and so the, this the story is partly a setup for for that. But yeah, uh, that was I think that was my least favorite of the stories. Mm. And and so speaking of the way that it's brought in later, let's go ahead and segue now into the ugly and cover the big bad. And uh, here it's going to get spoilerific. So I'd say that the the big bad is kind of twofold. I mean the the kind of pithy response is the big bad is racism right i mean that's you know because obviously it sucks and it's throughout the book it's a hindrance especially in that first chapter i really felt it and yeah. uh, uh and 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 obviously racism is bad but the more interesting thing to talk about i think is kayla brathwaite who for any <laughs> fellow gossip girl fans out there I kept picturing as Chuck Bass throughout this entire thing. So if anyone listening knows what that means, then immediately you you know what I'm talking about. That's the kind of character he is. Just this kind of smarmy, slick, really sure of himself, rich. Yeah. uh, Feels like he knows how to run everybody else's life better than they do sort of character. He's the sort that probably wears pink shorts and uh, and a polo shirt with the golf club. I, yeah, I see a pink polo shirt and like some plaid shorts. That's that's kind of... Or a sweater over his shoulders. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, probably has dated a Mitzi at some point. Oh, almost certainly. And I'll admit... I, Caleb was probably my favorite character in all of this, and that was one of my frustrations, is that I really hoped for an ending in which Caleb and Atticus became good friends. Mm. And, and, nah. and I know that that is, like, nigh impossible, but the fact that they kind of end at loggerheads really made me sad. I've manipulated you and everyone you love <laughs> for generations. Let's be buddies. <laughs> I mean, is that wrong of me to want that? You know, to want kind of a training day ending? But yeah, it's not to be. So one of the things that I read in the interview with Matt Ruff was that he had envisioned this as kind of an X-Files uh, starring a family of color. And I, I guess in that sense, Caleb is kind of the cigarette-smoking man of the series, if you will. <laughs> yeah, he just sort of shows up on the edges for, for many of the stories. Yeah. Who's actually the cause of a lot of it, though no one knows... I don't know, I liked I liked Caleb, and that's the one thing Lovecraftian that is absolutely in the story, is the idea of uh, kind of these sorcerers and wizards, uh, humans, uh, reaching high to try to take advantage of these powers that they really don't understand and that have all sorts of costs they don't understand, and so on and they so forth. have a tendency forth. to be destroyed by, by, by these powers. Absolutely, and... Uh, to be eaten alive from within the family and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, that's one of the kind of, I think, uh, dullest aspects of Lovecraft, so I was a little uh, frustrated by that. You know, again, Caleb not necessarily a monster, so not not your usual sort of, you know, it's not like, oh, well, he's a spider, but he's from outside of time and space, yada yada, you know. Uh, Caleb's just, just a guy who uh, thinks he's better than everyone else, and and, I mean, honestly, I think if this family had been white, he would have treated them exactly the same way, right? Like, I mean, I think he just thinks he's better than everyone, right? Yeah, I, I get the feeling race is not part of why he's manipulating them. It's because they, because of their bloodline. Yeah. You know, they're relatives of his through a circuitous route. And he is the epitome of privilege because not only is he fabulously wealthy fabulously connected he's also magic and untouchable (laughs) like uh yeah Um, and yet still he doesn't have what he wants he's got to manipulate other people to do stuff for him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as as for uh for me for the 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 scary parts actually the like the beginning of the book was was far scarier for me than than the later parts the uh, being pulled over by the cop in the uh, yeah. in the sundown town, nothing supernatural. Well, probably nothing supernatural <laughs> about it, but it was terrifying because uh, and it's difficult for me to put myself in that situation. But it was so well written that that I could, uh, along for the ride, see just how scary that is. 
And, and part of what's scary about it, and this I can empathize with, is just the sheer, oh, this is how it is, you know? Yeah. Uh, not, you know, uh, there's a bit of, like, this is unfair, but, but there's not that sort of outrage you would expect if this were to happen to a... You know, a white guy today, like, do you know who I am, and how dare you treat me like this, and I know my rights. Um, none of that. This, like, oh, this guy is gonna kill us. Oh, well, that uh, shit. <laughs> and and that's actually, uh, you, you're actually getting that mixed up with a bit later in the book. That that's actually a flashback that somebody else has, talks about later in the book. The beginning part, which is similar in a way, is Atticus has a flat tire, and he can't get anybody from the nearby town to help him out and so he, ha- he has right, to he has right. to use the guide and uh, call and i i remember yeah there's that great bit where he's had to wait all day to get this tire mm-hmm. taken care of and this guy travels from like three hours away from his shop and uh, i think he finds the uh the shop that'll help him out in the guide and the guy comes down right. and changes the tire and it takes 15 minutes and atticus is like you know, he just wants to cry from the sheer, like, it's just not a big deal. Yet, because of that, he's been stuck here all day. Right, And right. that's the part that I really empathized with, because, you know, especially, like, I've, I've been dealing with a broken back the past couple of months, and there's so many things where it's like, man, you know, like, this has become an ordeal, and this is just nothing, you know? Um, and, it, and it becomes so frustrating, and when exterior forces have control of your life like that, it can just drive you insane, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, both of those sections I thought were really, really good. It it reminded me of Jessica Jones in a way, you know, that that kind of feeling of almost paranoia at every step because you are the other. You are the outside. And even though, no matter what the Constitution and the courts might have said, that's not going to save you if right. if if you need saving, there's there's, there's definitely a, a a tinge of resignation that kind of makes it more sad. Yeah. The other scary part was the invisible things in the woods, just kind of a on a more micro scale and nothing particularly deep or profound. But there was something big and invisible killing cops in the woods, and that that scene was awesome. Hmm. Oh yeah, the bear or something. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and. Uh... Uh, let's let's deal with. Uh, would you recommend this book, Skix? I think I know your answer. I absolutely would. Yes. I think I would recommend this to specific people. I I, I think like <laughs> I think like hipster white guys and 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 women would probably really like this. And and I would love the like I don't know how to say that. Any friends of color who I have, I would love to have them read it and have a discussion with them about it. But in general, I don't know. I I just like. I feel like it's kind of two separate books, and one of them's really good, and one of them, eh, you know? I, I feel like kind of the the capturing the Jim Crow South and all that sort of stuff is a really good book, and then the Lovecraft stuff, which is what I was invested in, isn't necessarily as good. It's kind of like how Jessica Jones is this great feminist tale, but the story itself is pretty dull, I think, so... I, I think we should, uh, or I think I, I look forward to what the author is going to do next. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. If if it is Lo- uh, and, Lovecraft Country too, then we'll be back here talking about it. I'm sure. You know, I, I I mentioned it earlier, but but to clarify, the recommendation I got for this book was from a person of color, so it's got that much imprimatur. <laughs> Someone on the internet who at least says they're a person of color says this is a good book about people of color. One person of color out there probably likes this, so there you go. It's probably Ben Carson. <laughs> Oh, no, my luggage. I, I take that back. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, I think I think that's a good place to end it. I will say once again, we're interested in getting submissions from you guys. Uh, we're looking for stuff that's already been published. Even if it's self-published, that's fine. Uh, you know, no uh, unedited manuscripts, please. Uh, and No work in progress, nothing on fanfic.net. Right, right. Although... I love me some fanfic.net. Uh, but yeah, please uh, please send it in. And as long as it's something that seems professionally done and everything, we'll, uh, we'll try our best to, uh, to cover it. It might not be, you know, in the next few episodes, but, uh, but down the line, and we'll, we'll make sure to kind of mention it as we go along. And that email address, as I'm sure you know, dread.dialectic at gmail.com. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skixmatics. Thank <laughs> you.
You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Thank you.